They roamed North America when there were giant lions, when there were woolly mammoths. And they're the ones that have hung on. They're the surviving species that's here. People just haven't been thinking how we might try to get more insights about these animals. We've been interested in understanding how grizzly bears affect musk oxen. We can't just make believe this is Serengeti or Yellowstone and get a lot of interactions. We don't see that. Hence, we dress up as a grizzly bear and approach groups. But it's a little bit more interesting than just being in grizzly bear costume. I'm Joel Berger. I'm a wildlife biologist. I work for the Wildlife Conservation Society and I'm a professor at Colorado State University. I'm standing just southeast of the Igachuk Hills in Arctic, Alaska. It's an area where we still have a lot of land that is one of the least densely populated parts of the world, where we have wildlife that still exists now as it did 5,000 years ago. So to find musk oxen is not very easy. It's not like we can just drive out to find musk ox. And so Dr. Ellen Chang and I will be out on snow machines in the winter because you get around on snow machines. In the summer, you can't get around very much. Sometimes we'll hire and do an aerial flight so we can know where the groups are. Sometimes groups can be 30 or 40 miles apart over pretty difficult terrain where you're going up and down, up and down. But once we know where they are, we'll go out to each group and visit each group so we can start to understand how different factors are affecting herd productivity. When one looks at a musk ox and they think, oh, they're like a buffalo or a bison, but this species is unusual. Their closest relatives are sheep and goats. They run uphill, just like goats do when they're afraid, and they have these little tiny, tiny, tiny poops like a goat does. Musk ox are an Arctic adapted species. They live only in the Arctic. Their home that they really like is in the hills, in the mountains, in the rocky slopes. They have generally a slow metabolic rate so that they're not always burning, burning, burning. They put on lots of fat, but the most uh, impressive thing to me and to many people about a musk ox is that they have these really thick fur coats. They produce this very, very fine underwool. It's called kiviat, uh, and it's eight times warmer than sheep wool. What eats musk oxen are wolves and grizzly bears and occasionally, occasionally a polar bear. Unlike so many hooved mammals that run and flee, these guys stand tight in tight circles, almost like those old movies of wagon trains. And when you circle the wagon, that's what musk oxen do. Now, what's the advice that you are given when you run into a bear? Don't run. So if a musk oxen group runs, they might be dead meat. Grizzly bears have much better success when musk ox run than when musk ox stand their ground. And so we're interested in understanding, do groups with and without males differ in whether they run? Here in Alaska, where there's a hunting season of musk oxen, there had been in the past a disproportionate offtake of more males. So some herds only had females and young. If we find that female groups without males are more vulnerable to grizzly bears, maybe because they run more when there aren't males to make them more sedentary, that would argue that we should not be harvesting more males. Our research is testing some assumptions about whether or not that makes some sense. When I see a herd of musk ox, we have to figure out how to approach them to get data. And so ideally, I want to get within 50 yards of them. And so how do we do that? Well, that is a little bit tricky at times. There is a little bit of element of excitement when one approaches closely. Grizzly bears don't just like walk into a group of musk oxen. They meander, they meander, they go back and forth. And so I meander a little bit. What I will do is 
First understand when the first individual in a group becomes vigilant to me, and I measure that distance. Is it 400 yards? Is it 250 yards? Then as I continue to approach as a grizzly bear, I ask, what is the distance when half the group notices? Then I ask, when do they run together to clump? And then once they're clumped, I will continue. Then do they run away from me? Do they stay? Do they start to swivel and turn and turn? Do they run 20 yards and stop? And I continue to force this situation so I can understand, are they likely to flee or to stay? This is my fourth or fifth year of doing this. Not once have I been charged by a cow. On seven occasions, males have left the group to come toward me. On three of those, those were real charges. I think it's not a common behavior because it's risky to the bulls. The idea to approach as a grizzly bear is multifaceted, like most things in science. They're not just one dimensional. We need a control because we're doing science. So what would a good control be? It would be a species that is non-threatening, caribou. So our control is to dress up as a caribou and we approach, and that reflects then whether or not muskox respond differently to grizzly bears than they do to caribou. Our work is also looking at what happens in cold winters, in good summers, in bad summers, in bad winters. Just as scientists can measure the growth of tree rings to gauge whether there were drought conditions or wet conditions, for muskox we can look at the facial sizes and changes across time. So we want to measure how fast babies are growing, yearlings are growing, juveniles are growing. One can walk in with a camera, do photo imaging of the distance between the eyes, then if the animal turns, you can get distance from the horns to its nose, and then you can calculate what its head size is. But as they're changing incrementally, you can measure that, and that's what we're doing. So we can start to understand what happens with the kind of challenging events that this species faces as the planet is warming. Let's face it, it's miserable out here in the wintertime, but to be out with these animals is, is phenomenal. Muskox are symptomatic of an entire system, an array of species, of lifestyles, and if we start to understand and appreciate their role in the system, then there's a being. There's a reason that I think we should care or have compassion, because they're part of a landscape that predates us by many millions of years.